Okay, hello. Got something a little bit different for you here today. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> kind of systems programming language oriented, according to the title of this video, whatever I called it. But we're going to be dealing with the Chip 8 today. So just wanted a sort of shorter series over something a little more gaming oriented, but still kind of systems programming. Um, we'll be making an emulator or interpreter for the Chip 8 sort of target or VM or interpreted programming language as they call it here on the Wikipedia page. This was made in the late 70s for 8-bit microcomputers, made for the Cosmic VIP, the Telmac 1800. It used an RCA 1802 chip, and it kind of just did black and white 8-bit games here, like this picture, late 70s, 1978, playing Space Intercept, kind of like a, a sort of UFO defense game here. He's got, I think this is a player, he's shooting like missiles at sort of blobs that fly across the screen. It had a, a limited resolution, just black and white monochrome on for uh, CRTs, you know, television displays or what have you back in the day. But it's it's a good emulation target. It's pretty easy for like beginners and stuff. So I'm going to get my feet wet with this. And then later on, hopefully I can move on to a Game Boy or GBA or Atari or something. <laughs> something more, you know, more in depth later for uh, emulation or interpreter targets. But the input for this thing since this was before, you know, the arrow keys and WASD and everything, the input was this sort of 16 character hexadecimal keypad over here, you know, zero to F. So that's a little bit different, but some, some game consoles in the late seventies kind of had keypads like that, like the, the Atari VCS and other things, I think had that maybe in the Magnavox Odyssey. I don't remember too much, but I haven't looked up those in, in a while. So it was the chip eight later on in the nineties for this, it was ported to, it's a pretty easy port target anyway, but it was ported to the HP 48 graphing calculators and they had an extension called S-Chip or Super Chip 8, which added double the resolution and some scrolling functions and other things. We're just gonna, we're just gonna focus on like the regular baseline Chip 8. Although if there's interest in making Super Chip 8 sort of extension to this emulator, then I can do that, that's no problem. Or XO Chip or some other things if, if wanted. Uh, but this this wiki page sort of has the whole, you know, the layout of how the machine is. It had 4K RAM, it had the uppermost bytes for display refresh, and the call stack, internal use, other variables. I'm probably going to keep these separate and not just pointers to RAM, although you could do that. I'm going to try to make a simple emulator, not really a Cosmac VIP emulator <laughs> for the machine. I don't have the ROM for it or anything, although you can find the listing for the ROM if you find the, the PDF for the machine, which I also have just in case. Um, this includes a listing for the ROM and everything in it, uh, but I'm not really going to be going over that. But I did look at that for 36 or 37. Yeah, so it has the interpreter. I guess it doesn't have the ROM. It has the interpreter listing for Chip 8, the original Chip 8 interpreter, and uh, the memory layout. So I, I was viewing this because, you know, I was trying to decide, do I want to put the registers in memory or outside of memory? I don't know. But this just shows, you know, originally the display refresh was at the top of RAM, followed by the registers and the stack and other things. But in the interpreter in the beginning, uh, I'm going to put the fonts at the start of RAM just because that's easy and a lot of people do that. So, but okay, that's later on when we go and implement it. Just wanted to give a, a slight overview for the chip 8. It was an 8-bit machine. It was made for 8-bit machines. <laughs> Rather, it was a virtual machine target, interpreted programming language target, and it was made for porting software and, and games. So. Pretty simple as far as uh, virtual machines go, 35 opcodes. I guess you could say it's kind of a bytecode interpreter since all the opcodes are only two bytes, maybe, sort of. But there's only about 30 to 35 of these, so it's not too bad. A couple discrepancies between original Chip 8 and Super Chip 8, but those don't seem to be too bad if we want to allow for those in, in our emulator. Graphics and sound, it had 64 by 32 resolution, whopping 2 to 1 ratio. They didn't need 4 by 3 back then. They were too far beyond that. <laughs> no 16 by 9 for them. 2 by 1, that's where it's at. And monochrome, you don't need more than two colors anyway, on or off. We had sprites, 8 pixels wide, 1 to 15 pixels in height. That corresponds to the display opcode, where this N here is the width, X and Y or XY on the screen. Okay, and then they are XORed, so pixels are XORed with the display, and if they're flipped off, then the carry flag is set. So you have 16 data registers, V0 to VF, for hexadecimal, and VF is used as a carry flag, so you probably don't want to use that for general computation, unless you're trying to, you know, bit pack and save space and stuff, but 
Okay. So we had addresses, we have constants, we have register IDs, we have a program counter, an index register, and the data registers. So interestingly enough, although this has the program counter that is not in the original chip eight sort of spec, and it's not really in any technical references I've seen, but of course the machine, the Cosmac VIP, Tomac 1800, would have had to have a way to, you know, use a program counter, instruction pointer. So we'll be using that. I just thought that was interesting that they use it here as an, an abstract concept thing. But uh, yeah, it wasn't in the actual machine, no specific program counter. But they did use specific registers, you know, the original machine registers have their uses here, which is interesting, but anyway. Um, I'll, I'll provide links to things in the description, and I'll try to remember where I got this PDF and provide a link to that as well, because it's interesting for historical reasons. Shows how the fonts is laid out, for example. They kind of packed them in here so that each letter or character is part of the next one. I thought that was interesting and, and nice. So how are we going to develop this chip 8 interpreter, emulator, what have you? I'll just call it an emulator because most people call it that, and, and that's fine, even if it's not technically the best kind of correct. That's all right. I'll be developing this in C and SDL2, just because those are things that I've used before and know for the most part. Um, on Linux, on Unix, that's easy enough to install. On Windows, you can go and find stuff to install. So I'll go over that. I'll install some C development tools for me. GCC and Make is what I will be using. Of course, our Make file is going to be really simple, a couple lines. You could just use a build script, but I'm going to use Make because I like typing four letters for Make instead of you know, eight letters for build.sh when I want to build the thing. Yeah, I'll do GCC and make, and we'll use SDL2 to have a cross-platform framework and library for displaying a window and sound and everything. This did have sound. I didn't say that. That's part of the reason I'm using SDL2 for cross-platform audio. I had a couple timers, one of which is the sound timer. Ticks down at 60 hertz, 60 frames a second, if you will. When it's non-zero, a beeping sound is made. So a single a single tone, I guess. We'll just do like standard A, 440 hertz or something, or make that configurable. That's fine. Uh, but okay, we need development tools, right? So Linux and Unix, that's easy enough. This, I'm on Ubuntu. I have a sort of programming folder here. So I'm on Ubuntu here. That should be the up-to-date version by the time of recording this. And, you know, you can install... GCC and make, I already have these installed, but if you don't, I mean, you can install them. Uh, it takes a second for my network to work through the VM, usually. And for sudo to wake up, yeah, I already have them installed. But on Windows, if you want some C development tools, I had a friend tell me about this site, newone.net. Uh, I think they're a little bit older, but that's okay. The MinGW distro, that is, it's a little bit older or out of date. I think GCC has a 12.0 version now, but that's fine. Uh, this comes with GCC, MinGW, minimum GNU for Windows, a sort of C runtime and environment to run things with. Well, not C, GNU <laughs> runtime for things. It has, uh, you know, C++ things. It does come with its own version of STL. I'll be taking whatever the newest version is in my distro or on available for, for Windows. But it does come with an older version if you want to use that, as well as Make and Git and 7-Zip and other good stuff. So the reason I got this is because it's relatively simple. It's an EXE that you download, shady EXE from the internet <laughs> that you download, and you extract. It extracts into its own folder. It's self-contained. It's portable. And you can make a shortcut and just run it, and it opens, you know, a command prompt window or what have you. And you have GCC and Make installed, so that's why I got it, just for those two things, and it's pretty nice. If you already have Git, you can get the smaller version or just get that. But really, it's an EXE you put somewhere and you extract it. On my machine... I don't quite remember where I had it. I think it's in here. Yeah. <laughs> and when you extract it, it forms a MinGW folder. If you can read that, this is where I put it on my machine. It has these things included by default. It has, you know, 64-bit MinGW here. And you can make a shortcut to the open distro window.bat, which is also in the readme file, it tells you. Which is also on his page here. He'll he'll tell you. <laughs> just make a shortcut to that. And I put that just on my desktop. I have it MinGW distro. Double click and open it. Now OBS won't capture the UNC prompts and stuff, so sorry about that, or UAC prompt. So I'll have a black screen there, but once you do that, you know, it'll set up the paths and everything. You'll have GCC and make installed. That's so pretty nice. And if you're if you're worried about it, I mean all the code is in there. It's open source. 
NGW, what it does, you know, the scripts that you're gonna run, they're in here. I mean, those are other things. This is just the bat file. It just sets up paths. It's really, it's it's fine. It's legit. It's not like a shady thing. <laughs> so I wouldn't recommend something that's gonna like break your PC. But anyway, it has GCC and make. Other than that, you'll need SDL. So I'm gonna go to the SDL wiki, wiki.libsdl.org. And the main page, libsdl.org, if we want to get SDL. I'm going to go to installation on the wiki, however, just because I'm going to go over Linux first and then Windows for installing this. And there should just be sudo apt-get install SDL2 and SDL2-dev. I don't think those are the names, though, although I already have it installed. But if we look for libsdl2, we'll see that it's SDL2-2.0-0 for this latest version of my Ubuntu here, Jammy. So I'm saying that because if you do, you know, sudo apt get install libsdl2, it's not going to work, even though their website says that's what you need to do. It's unable to locate the package, so you actually have to do dash 2.0-0 or download like the tarball from the, their GitHub releases. But I'll just say we're going to work with the one in the repo because it's there. I already have it. And we'll also get the dev version because that's what the web page said. Okay, we already have that. So if we want to do like a test program for this just to make sure it's installed, that's fine. I'm going to make something called like chip8 emulator that we're going to go into. We'll make, I'll have a make file because I'm going to use make and some sort of C file. So make file, I'm just going to do, we'll say GCC, I'll have a source file, we'll say chip8.c. And we'll have an output for chip8, that's fine. I do want to do C flags, we'll have a couple of those. And we'll just set this up by default here. We'll say, we'll have a C17 project. I'd use C23 or whatever the newest version is, but that's not out yet, or it's not supported by this version of GCC. So the last one that is fully supported, 17. And we'll just enable errors and warnings and things. So W all. W all, W extra, and W error. Okay, just so it tells me, you know, things are bad, we need to make them better. All right. And we'll just have a hello world here, but I will be including SDL.h so we can use SDL stuff. SDL.h, not, you know, mixer graphics or anything. This is sort of like a catch all that has um, a lot of the other SDL headers included, so you don't have to include those separately. I think you can put this in double, uh, in brackets, not double quotes. I'm putting it in double quotes so I can differentiate from just the C standard live headers here. But I'll have my normal main, argv, and we'll just say testing on Linux. We'll do that, yeah. So include SDL error. We don't know how to include it. Well, if you know where it is manually on your distro, you can, you know, put it in for dash L lives or dash I include on your GCC compile line. Or they also provide an STL2 config utility to sort of evaluate that for you at runtime. So I'll be using that. Pass it double dash C flags and double dash lives. And later when you're bored, you can play double dash on your GameCube. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll do that here. We'll go in the make file, and I'll just put that here. Backtick, sdl2 config, c flags and libs. And there we go. Now we have errors for, you know, unused argc and argv, because we have errors on and stuff like that. So we'll just, uh, we'll mulligan those. We'll punt those off till later. We'll say, hey, they're technically being used, even though they aren't being used. Just cast it to void, get rid of those errors there. There we go. And so compilation was all right. If we run it, we'll get testing on Linux and we're good. Okay. So what does this actually evaluate to on my distro? We have user include SDL2. So that's where stuff is included from. We have a reentrant uh, environment variable set. So it's reentrant. Okay. And we're linking in SDL2. All right. So that's what you'd have to sort of manually do if you didn't have this. Windows doesn't have it, so we'll do it a little bit differently on Windows, but I'll go ahead and install that. So for Windows, I'm just gonna get the, the latest version from their releases page. So 
with sdl.org, I'm just going to the current stable version up here, this link, which is 2.24.1. And I will grab the mingw zip because I'm using mingw, minimum GNU for Windows. I'm going to wherever I have stuff for programming. I'll just have a new stuff set up here. YouTube, I'll make a project folder and we'll just put it within there. So that'll be okay. So we can go in here or we can go in here. Eh, it doesn't matter. I use my mouse too much, but that's what I'm used to for window experience. I do have a guide also that I've read up on, which I have in the background here. I'll link this as well, I think, because it just goes through sort of pseudocode reasoning and things in case you need some extra help. And it was it was very helpful, at least as far as like the drawing instruction and stuff and other instructions. I was like, you know, he lays it out for you. I don't count that as cheating because <laughs> if you haven't done it before, maybe you don't know. But I'll link that because that guy is very helpful as well. Uh, but OK, on Windows. OK, let me close literally everything out and then go to where I have the stuff installed. So SDL2 here. 7-zip or whatever, you can just extract. It'll make an SDL2 folder, and inside we'll have 32-bit and 64-bit targets for minimum GNU for Windows, or runtimes, or however. Um, and we'll do similar things to how we did on, similar things to how we did on Linux, but um, I'm going to manually include the sort of libs and includes that we would have to, that, that would be handled automatically by SDL2 config or other things. And I'll be targeting 64-bit, so AMD 64. But I'll make some uh, some things in here. I'm going to use my mingw distro, which will get another black screen for the UAC prompt, but I'll have that. And I'll just go to my folder here. Right, so I have that. So let's make a couple sort of zero byte files if I want to do command line, you know, nonsense here. We'll just put nulls into make file and ship eight. And I do have. Uh, NeoVim on this as well. So, okay, I'll do this similarly to how I had it on Linux. We'll do this. I'll have the C flags, but I'm going to be manually including some lives and includes. So I'll have some extra, some extra uh, make variables here. Do dash capital L lives and dash capital I includes. Okay, so we'll set up those vars here. I'll have the similar things, C17 and all extra and errors for warnings. And lives will have, you know, wherever our libraries are. I'm going to use relative paths. I'll take those out. Or I'll use those. So we'll go into SDL. Let's go into 64-bit minimum GNU. We'll go to lib. And we'll just grab the lib folder here. That will... That'll ensure when, if we did dash uh, lowercase l sdl or sdl2, it would find this sdl2 a or yeah, sdl2 dot a here for this library, so it would be linked in correctly. I'm just going to grab that, and I don't remember how to paste this in in Windows if it's Control Shift V or middle click or what. I don't remember. So um, is it double quote plus paste? Thought normally that worked. That's okay. I can just echo that in here. <laughs> because I got rid of it. Uh, professional as always, we'll just echo that in there. That's fine. <laughs> and for the dash I, capital I includes, from the SDL folder in the 64-bit target, we'll go to the include folder, SDL2, and this holds all the SDL-defined like headers for development. So we're, I'm using include SDL.h in my code, in my examples, and that you know has some other things in here. Message box, mutexes, sensor shapes, threads. It has a bunch of things, kind of like a catch-all. And that's white and blinding, so I'll get rid of that. But yeah, otherwise you can include these things manually for the timer, video, or other things. So we'll just be grabbing this whole folder for include. And I'll echo that in as well. So we'll just grab the one that ends in live. I'll put with live except I want it to be a relative path. And since I have this in here, in case I want to move it around later, I have this make file in the same folder as the SDL folder, I can do that. So I'll have this, and let's just put this with dot. 
and put that there. Okay, so this won't work um, right now. I mean, I don't have anything in chip eight, do I? I don't have any code written yet, and I can't type. So let's write that example. Of course, I have my blasphemous uh, non-monospace font here, but I'm just typing up the same example as I did in Linux. I can't increase the font size, unfortunately, in here as easily. So if it's hard to read, it's the same thing that's in the Linux example. Except I'll put testing on Windows. Okay, so we can try and make uh, W errors. Yeah, that's right, that's not. That's right, it's not right. Error, not errors. So will it compile? Will it blend? That is the question. It will not because we have unused parameters. Because I forgot to void those suckers out. Or otherwise use them. Okay, control reaches end of non-void function. Oh, so it's a little more secure on Windows. Gets a little extra error there. Um, we can return, you know, zero or one or what have you. Make sure that's there. And it doesn't work. Undefined reference to win main. So there are a couple of extra things we need to do, at least as far as MinGW and SDL. So I'll be putting those in now. So undefined reference. So at the end of, I'll put it with the includes or I'll put it with the live. I'll put it with the lives. I'll have the lowercase l MinGW32. So I know that's one thing that I do need. We still have undefined references, but this time it's from CRT0. Uh, okay, so we can use SDL's own version of main, a sort of wrapper for main that uh, our regular win main can be converted into if we want to use the regular int argc character argv, you know, how do you call that, function signature. So <laughs> I will link in SDL2 main after, after mingw because if you put mingw uh, after SDL2, when, you, when you're linking this in, you'll still get errors. But if we link in SDL2 main and SDL2, this will work. But well, I can show the error first if you don't link in the last one. So you have un, undefined reference to set main ready. And you can fix that by linking in SDL2. But yeah, so if you do all these three, it will work. You know, it will actually compile there. And you'll have your EXE that works. So that's always good. This is error level, I think. Yeah, so that's good. But I will show that you do need MinGW first in this list. Because if you have it last, unfortunately, it you'll still get an undefined reference. It won't convert the main correctly unless you link in the MinGW first. And I know that's probably obvious to a lot of people. Or maybe it is, maybe it's not. But I spent a lot of time looking up that error because I didn't know what was going wrong. Um, and it was MinGW specific, and I had to link it in before. SDL2 main and SDL2, but okay. Assuming you have all those set up correctly, then you do get your final output, you know, and it does work and it runs. So that's good. So, okay, that's installing GCC and Make and SDL2 on either Linux, in my case, Ubuntu or Windows. So I'm going to be doing the bulk or probably all of my development on Linux in my, in my VM here, just because it's gonna be similar to both and I have, you know, my environment set up and everything how I like. I don't have WSL2. I like to keep things, you know, separate as much as I can, but that's okay. Okay, I'll just be doing my development here on Ubuntu, just because I have it how I like it. So STL2, using STL2, I'm going to set up some basic boilerplate or just setup code for a window, um, probably just a single solid color, and some input to close the window. And that'll probably be it for this sort of intro video. That'll sort of be it for this intro video. On the next one, I'll probably get into actually doing the chip 8 and everything, but for this sort of intro one, just installation, basic kind of SDL boilerplate setup. So, okay, we have the main here. We have our main squeeze, that's all right. <laughs> okay, so I wanna set up something for SDL, but how do you actually use SDL? Well, I'm gonna look that up in the docs. If I can escape my window. <laughs> in the SDL documentation, wiki.libsdl.org. Let's go to the API reference. So you can go by name and get a whole giant list if you just want refreshers on what you're looking for or if you want to see stuff. Or I'm going to go by category, which kind of breaks it down a little bit more as audio and 
timer support, separate mouse, key, key stick, key stick, joystick, game controller, sensors. I'll be doing keyboard handling, event handling for that, um, as well as audio later on and display in window. Probably just 2D accelerated rendering, just with the renderer and drawing either single pixels to the screen or just like rectangles. And later, maybe we can make like a texture and then copy to the texture buffer and then copy that to the window. It might be faster, it might be easier, I don't know. But I'll probably just do rectangles because it's easy for me to think of a single pixel as a rectangle and just draw it like that. For, for me, it's conceptually easier to think of that. And if it's too slow or not performant, then we can switch to doing like a texture and things later on. SDL, initialization and shutdown. We need the SDL init function first, and we end with SDL quit. And we set up the sort of, we initialize the subsystems within SDL that we want to use. So in our case, I will be doing video and audio. I will also be doing a timer. I think this has timer, but we can look that up in SDL init and find out. Yep, we have timer, audio, video, joystick, controller, events. Events will be handled from, events will be initialized with the video subsystem. So we, we don't have to worry about that. So I'll init video, audio, and timer. And some of these pages have examples, which is really nice. Because <laughs> a lot of things in industry don't actually have examples. Thank you, IBM. But that's all right. At least not usable ones that matter. We'll initialize things here and get, get the ball rolling. So I'm going to do that. So we'll need things that are going to be carried around within SDL, but we'll say we'll initialize it here. Um, that doesn't say what we're going to need. Well, I, I know personally later on we're going to need like, like a window and a renderer and everything. So I'll do that. But I want to keep things outside of main and kind of have it read easy. So I'm going to have sort of separate helper functions as we go along for these things. So I'll have like a cleanup function at the end that'll have SDL quit and maybe any uh, any heap allocation we do, I'll clean up along the way. So I'll have a function for that, but let's say we have an init SDL function, which won't take anything in right now. It will later on. I'll just call it final cleanup void. Yeah, final program cleanup, we'll have it final cleanup before we exit, and we'll have initialize SDL. So what are we doing with these? Well, we'll be doing SDL init within here. So I know if SDL init, SDL init video, ord with SDL init audio, ord with SDL init timer, and their example is not equal to zero, right? Yeah, so it just returns an int. And zero would be the success condition. We can call log. I don't remember if log goes to like standard out or error. STL get error is nice. That's kind of like a string error thing to get error no. Um, we have quit that we'll call at the end. Let me make an extra page here. STL log, where does that go? Debug output stream. I'm just wondering where it goes. Does it go to standard error? Does it even say? This just says where it goes. It goes to standard error or the debug output stream. Okay, so we can use SDL log. It'll go to the standard error. That's fine. We can keep it all within SDL, I guess, or we can do like an fprintf situation. Doesn't really matter, but we'll handle the error here. It looks like it's probably a wrapper for fprintf going to standard error anyway. So if this does not equal zero and we couldn't initialize things, then we have an error. So it's just called log, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to put could not initialize SDL subsystems. And that's not good. We'll have a error condition there, which is get error. Yeah, get error. Okay. And we can return one or do other things. I'm going to do, I'll probably use Booleans. We'll say this failed, we'll call a Boolean. I might change, you know, all these signatures and things later. Just right now, I'll, you know, I'll iterate as we go, we'll say. That's more in tune with how real life development goes, right? This isn't fully <laughs> worked out beforehand. I don't have a script, so sorry if it's annoying. And some aspects from that. I'm gonna include standard live because for final exit and cleanup and everything, 
I'm going to call exit and we'll do either success or failure, which should be defined to be zero or one. But in this case, we'll do success um, just for a final exit there. And if we need to exit early later on, we can do that. I'll also include bool and I'll say we can return false here. Otherwise, we would have initialized and we're good. So at the end, we can return true. So we finish that function successfully. The reason I'm doing this is so I can have code down here where we call init SDL and we can say if we could not initialize it, then I'm going to exit with exit failure. So you see, I'm, I'm wrapping my trains of thought together. They're just kind of a uh, you know, separate. I have some separate threads having race conditions on my mouth moving, so that's not good. <laughs> that didn't make any sense. But okay, so final cleanup when we call this at the end before we leave the program. I don't need testing on Linux anymore. And I'll probably pass stuff to that later to clean up heap allocations, like I said, but we'll call SDL quit here. And this will... Um, this will shut down the SDL subsystems. So init sets them up and quit sort of shuts them down. So right now we shouldn't have anything wrong except, yeah, got the function signature wrong, that's capital. All of the SDL sort of namespaced items are gonna be capital SDL underscore capital something. <laughs> How do they call that? Pascal case, I think, functions. So those will be easy enough to identify from the other things that will all have SDL underscore prefix to them, if you're wondering. So we got that. Okay, it's not going to do anything right now. Yeah, but that works. And zero. Okay. So we want something to actually show up like a window, so I'm going to go to their documentation for windowing. And I didn't read about quit, but I don't think it matters too much. We just know that you do that. They set up add exit. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go to da, 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 video. Yeah, display and window management. We will create a window. Sure. We can create a render at the same time, but in case you want to see something in your title bar, if you have one, um, we're going to just create a normal window. So we need a window pointer to create window, given the title XY width and height and some flags or zero. And here are the flags. I will do probably just zero <laughs> because I'm lazy, but you can do a borderless window, you can do full screen, you can do borderless full screen. I'm assuming if you order them or them together, stuff like that. And they have examples. So SDL window pointer window. They initialize video, make a window. If you don't get anything back and it's null, it's bad. They have a delay. We'll get to that in a minute, probably. And you destroy the window to close it up and you clean up. Okay, so we'll do a similar thing to that. Uh, we'll say we'll clean up the window here. I'll do this first because I'm not going to remember, assuming we have some sort of window. So I'm going to have a overall, let's say an SDL object, and I'll just have type diffs out here. I don't like having globals, but I can have type diffs be global just so these things, these functions can uh, understand those types and I won't get errors. But let's have a struct. And I'm just going to make like an SDL sort of typed struct here. SDL window pointer, we'll just call it window. And I know I'll have a renderer later. Well, I guess I can leave that off till we do that. <laughs> it make more sense. We'll say we have an SDL window window. And in it SDL, let's just say we have SDL T SDL is zero. I'm going to try not to malloc things if I can help it and just have things be, you know, static and compiled statically initialized just on the stack or wherever. So it might take up a little bit of memory, but I don't think overall whatever I'm going to be doing in this file is not going to be like using megs of memory or anything. So we, we shouldn't need too much heap allocation, but what we do, we can deal with. Um, I'm just going to have this be sort of like this. <laughs> initialize an empty thing here. I'm going to pass it to init SDL so that I can keep this nice little one-liner for exit condition. Although it won't clean it up, if it does exit, it's not going to clean up. So maybe I could do an at exit there, but I'll think about that in a bit. SDLT SDL will pass in, and this could probably be a constant. Um, SDL is not going to be changing, but the contents will change. Maybe not. 
Oh well, let's set up a window. Let's do our SDL window. We'll be create window. We'll give it a title. I don't remember what I was there. <laughs> title X, Y with height and flags. X, Y with height and flags. Flags can be zero, so I'll do that. Title will just say chip eight emulator. X, Y, I'm gonna do whatever they have for their flags. Window position, which they don't have. Yeah, here we go. Window position centered or undefined. I'm just gonna have it be in the middle of the window for simplicity. So I'll do SDO window position centered. Same thing for this. And the width and the height, I want to kind of be dynamic. Um, well, not really dynamic, more if we do resizable, they could be dynamic. I'm not gonna do resizable just to be simple with it. I'll just say our SDL, our chip eight emulator is gonna be a single size that you can set at runtime when you first call it. But I do kind of want these things to be configurable by the user or by the dev that's working on this. So for overall, I'm gonna say emulator configuration stuff. <laughs> I'm gonna make another struct that I'm gonna make for configuration. I'm gonna call it a config. I'll have a config type. And it'll include things like a window width and height that we want the emulator to use, like a how fast our chip eight VM or CPU or what have you is going to run. Um, let's say the colors for this, you know, stuff like that, like the pixel color and the background color. So I wanna put these things, I wanna make them changeable maybe through command line flags or something that are passed in. So I'm gonna have an object to hold that state that I can pass around and just, you know, keep it all in one place. Maybe, hopefully it'll be easier to, to keep track of that way. So let's say we have a window width and height. Uh, window width, some things I like to be fixed type, just cause I don't have to think about if int is 32 bit or 64 bit on whatever platform I'm on, so. We could do int and it wouldn't matter. These are gonna be small numbers, but we'll just say these are gonna be 32-bit. And we'll have SDL window width and window height. Those be lowercase. Okay, so these can be that. This will be, we'll need the config if we pass that in here. I don't think I'll be changing the config though. So let's say we're pa we pass in one here. I'll just call it config. We'll say this would be config window width, and we'll have window height. Just put that there for flags. Let's say, just so I don't forget, if we, and <laughs> we can put the error condition here. If it did not work, we'll log, we'll say could not create window, STL window. And we'll return false, that didn't work. But assuming it did work, we will have a window. I guess I'll put new lines for these, right? Yeah, okay. So I have a config object, let's do that as well. Initialize emulator, we'll say options. I don't know. <laughs> Emul initialize emulator configuration slash options. I'll probably have helper functions for most of these things. But I'll just lay these out here to say that they're initialized from main. And we'll pass them to other areas. Let's say we have another function here. I'm gonna put it here um, for the config. So I, I want some things to be passed, to be configurable, either at runtime or passed in initially from the command line as flags, like a dash w for window width or something. I'll probably have a function here to get those. I'll say setup, setup initial emulator configuration from passed in arguments. I'll just, we'll call it that. I'll have it be a boolean in case something goes wrong. I'll have it set, set config from args. Maybe that's simple enough to, uh, to understand. We'll pass in config t config here, and we'll need to, I'll pass in the, uh, <laughs> the initial arguments from main as well. V, I can type in V. Now I'm not gonna change these. 
I will change the config, however. So let's say if this didn't work, if not set config from args, config argc argv, then we'll exit, have a graceful failure condition. Okay. So I want to set these up initially. So let's say, let's set default. So we'll set default and later on we can add in code to, uh, we, can, we can add in code to override different options depending on what was passed in from the command line. So we'll do that, we'll do that later. Okay, but I'll set my defaults here. I wonder if I can set, I don't know if I can set the, yeah, this can be an L value, right? So that would be okay. Cause I wanna, I wanna try to make things like sort of modern, like designated initializers and things. So I think this will work if I do like window width, let's say we have a default window width. So the ship eight was 64 by 32 originally. So let's go with that. We'll do 64. I don't know if this is the right way you uh, you do designated initializers though, so this might be wrong. But 64 by 32 was the original resolution. Chip 8 original X resolution, and this was the original Y resolution. Let's just see, do I have an error? Probably a bunch of errors, yeah. Constant int arc C, unused parameter, yes. Um, it's an int, right? For int i, we'll just have this less than argc i plus plus. Well, we'll start at one because argc zero would be argv zero would be the name of the program. Well, we can do, yeah. So if we if I do something like argv argc minus one or something, I mean argc zero is the program. I want to start at one, so I'm like, how do I start at one? I'll probably just make that one and do i here. My brain's getting ahead of myself a bit too much. Okay, I'm not even using this right now. This is just so that I have the variables used so I don't have an error. So I'm not even doing that with anything, doing anything with that, but I'll just do this. Okay. Print compiler error from unused variables, argc, argv, okay. All right, so destroy window, yep, that's undeclared. So final cleanup, let's pass in SDL. I'm not gonna be changing the state. Well, I might be changing the state, we'll do that. Here, let's do STLT pointer SDL and we'll clean up SDL window. Although we won't be using this anymore, so really we could probably just pass in the object and get the pointer from it and destroy that. That should be okay. That should be okay. Too few arguments, that's true. We added the config to that. That's an init SDL. Um, I'll need that first then, let's do that first. Cause I will need that for initializing SDL. Okay, character pointer pointer. Incompatible pointer type, set config, constant character, pointer, pointer. Is that not right? Mm. Expected constant, but it's just character. Okay, well, you know, I won't be doing constants then. <laughs> I wanted to make things better saying, hey, we're not affecting it explicitly, but I guess we are. And then that's just a regular SDL, so get rid of that. Compiler errors, they're wonderful. End of non-void function, uh, 50. Yes, that's here. So that's a Boolean. Is that good? Okay. I just wanted to make sure my stuff's all right and this is a decent way to do this. Okay. So if we have the initial window width and height for here um, and other things can be set later, just so this look, this main function looks okay. We're passing that in so we can get rid of that because we're using them here. When we initialize SDL and we make the window, we will have the config window width and height set. Okay, so that should be all right. 
So we won't we won't have anything happen here, right? I don't think a window will pop up or anything. It'll just end and exit. You know, so that's okay. But we need something to actually show up if we want something to actually show up. So <laughs> I need a renderer for that. So I'm going to go to where the renderer was, which is SDL render, 2D accelerated rendering. Single pixel points, lines, rectangles, textures. I'm just going to create a renderer here, given a window, index, and flags. Index can be negative one. We'll just pass it the SDL window that we created and just do a zero for that. Like their example here. Or we don't have to do zero, we can do flags. We have software accelerated vsync and target texture. I'm going I'm just going to be doing render accelerated. Later if we do a texture, we can probably set target texture for that. Um, providing no flags gives priority to accelerated, but I'm just going to put that explicitly so we can do 2D hardware acceleration as it were. And then later we will have to destroy the render as well. It will be attached to the window, so I guess that's why you call that before destroy when. But I'm just saying this out loud so that I remember that I need to destroy things as well as create them. C++ esque uh, constructors and destructors. So okay, let's say we have to make a renderer here. That would mean within here, let's do STL renderer pointer renderer. I think that is correct. So here we make a window. And let's make a renderer, SDL renderer equals create renderer given a window, which will pass in the window that was created. And negative one is fine for an index and flags will do renderer accelerated. Okay. And again, we'll have if not renderer. Then we had an error and We'll put that there, could not create SDL renderer. All right, but assuming that all goes correctly, we'll have a renderer and a window, so we can draw to something now. That would be nice. But here we will also destroy the renderer before I forget. All right, we good there, we good there. Okay, so how do we make a window and like draw to it? Well. I don't think they have that in their example, do they? Oh, they do. So we'll, we'll use their sort of example, except I'm not using a texture, but we will clear the renderer, which in effect will clear it to a set background color. So we have to set a color first, which they don't have because they're using a texture, but that's okay. Uh, I'm just gonna do a single color window. So I'm gonna set a color. I'm gonna clear the window to that color. And I will call render present to sort of show or present that window and any changes that happen to it uh, to the user. If you know double buffering, render present is sort of displaying, swapping the front and back buffers and displaying that update to the user. That's what that will be doing. So let's do, um, we can do render clear, but I know I have to set a color. So we'll say, what do we have for that? Get draw color and set draw color. So I'm gonna set the draw color, which takes in a render, pointer to a render, RGB and A values, all U and eight. And we have a couple sort of macros or a constants we can use as well, alpha opaque. We can set a draw mode for alpha blending. I'm just gonna do solid colors, uh, fully opaque, just to be simple. Their example uses a rectangle. You can fill or draw rectangles with the color that was last set. So that's good to keep in mind. The last color that you set is what things will be drawn as. So if you set a color for yellow, whatever you draw after that point, if you don't change the color, is gonna be yellow. So if you wanna draw multiple colors, uh, multiple objects on the screen, you'll have to set render draw color multiple times. Just keep that in mind. And if you forget what it was, well, they have render draw color as a get function as well. Then I know we'll be calling render clear and present, but yeah, render clear and present. So, okay, we'll do an initial screen clear, initial screen clear here, and I'll call SDL might be one of the only things I do within a non-helper function, but that's okay. We'll do render clear given the renderer from the SDL object. And I know games for the most part have a sort of main game loop. My emulator is gonna be sort of similar. We're gonna run and emulate a VM. That's sort of, you know, it'll execute instructions and change its internal state and everything. I'm gonna have a sort of main emulator loop 
here to go along with um, a sort of game loop analog, as it were. Um, I probably won't keep this forever, but maybe I'll just do a infinite loop here right now. I'm trying to think, we could have like a state machine. I'm just trying to think if that makes sense doing it now or in like a minute when I do inputs. I might do that in a minute. Right now we can start with a basic forever loop, that's fine. So we cleared the screen. Uh, otherwise, normally you'd clear the screen on every frame, but I know that Chip 8 has instructions for clearing the screen, so I will conditionally clear the screen at runtime later within the Chip 8 as it's emulating the instructions. So right here, I'm just initializing it, which we need to set a draw color first, actually. <laughs> but I'm just initializing it um, to have a set background color first. But I know I don't need to, to clear the screen every game frame or every emulator loop because Chip 8 has an instruction to do that. That's why I'm not going to do it within our loop. So just trying to explain that here. But let's set the render draw color. So I know we need the renderer and we need some sort of RGB and A values. And I got to get those from somewhere. I'm going to set those within our config. So we have window width and height. I'm going to set sort of, let's say foreground and background colors. Let's say foreground color and background color for the chip eight here. So I'm going to say foreground color, and these are both going to be red, green, blue, um, 8888. Sorry, red, green, blue, alpha, 8888 for bits. So I'm just going to put that. And we can set those up. So if I go to set configuration, my defaults, uh, foreground color, let's say we're going to do, the original chip eight was white and black, so I can do that. Foreground would be the pixel color, so we can do all Fs for white. So this be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, sometimes I get that wrong, <laughs> the number of things to do here. Black would be zero. Um, just to know that it's working and that we have different values for this that aren't just F, so we can test that. I'm going to make this a different color. Let's say we make it yellow, which will only be red and green. It will not be blue, but we will have the alpha. So this will test because if it's not yellow, I'll know I got the ordering mixed up when I extract the RGB values from this, right? That's why I'm doing this partly. We'll say right now this is going to be yellow and this will be black. And they're sort of constants, so we'll yell it out here. <laughs> All right, so when I go and set the draw color, we'll say we'll set it to the background color. Um, let's just have, I might move this out later, but right now, yeah, I'll just have it in main. That's fine. Um, well, chip 8 is going to have an instruction to clear the screen, right? Yeah, so let me move this out, actually. I'll move this out. Um, Clear screen slash SDL window to background color. So let's just put this here. I'll avoid clear screen or clear window, what, what have you. We'll pass in the config to get the color from to clear it to. And that's what I'll do here. Just to keep things a little bit better. Uh, put that there. So I'm going to do an RGB and A, and we'll grab that from the background color. So how do we extract R? Well, I know I'm going to have to mask off the bits somehow. So I know we're working with a 32-bit number here for the color, RGBA. R is in the top eight bits, because I'm on a little Indian system. I'm targeting x86 here. Well, AMD64, but yeah. So to get the top bits um, from the number, I know these are each 8 bits, so I'm going to shift over by, if the A is in the lowest value, by 8, 16, 24, to leave the top 8 bits 25 to 32. Or, well, 0 based would be what? 25 to 31? Well, 24 to 31, I guess, yeah. So let's, let's uh, shift over by 24. And we'll end with just FF, just to make sure that we mask off the bottom 8 bits. Well, I think we could also just do UN8T and cast it and not need to mask. I think those both should work the same way, but I'll just mask it with a FF here. Although I'm not sure we actually need that because it'll probably be converted to UN8 from this being the, the L value. But anyway, I'm getting too far in the weeds and don't know what I'm talking about, so I tend to do that. 
uh, for G. I know that's going to be the next eight bits in the thing here, so we can just subtract eight from that. B again is going to be the next eight bits in A. We don't have to shift at all, but I'll do this just so it lines up and looks similar to these. Okay, so that should give the RGB and A values, and we'll clear it to that color. Okay, so it should be yellow, but we aren't going to see it. I guess within our loop, we can show changes to the user. Later on, the chip 8, according to its specs, um, updates the screen, the TV display that it was on, the CRT. It would update it. I'm assuming the, the CRT's refresh rate, and if it was on a TV, the standard NTSC rate would be 60 hertz. So 60 FPS, and that's what I'm going to make my target for this. So later on, I'm going to have a, a delay for 60 FPS. Right now, we can have an infinite, really fast loop, <laughs> which isn't great for performance. We can put in a sort of delay, I guess. And um, let's say update, update window with changes on every iteration. We'll have a delay for 60 hertz. 60 FPS, and we use SDL delay for that. I'll get to that. But to update the window with changes, I will have a function. Chip8 has its own drawing function, and I'll handle drawing uh, in a different way, I think, later on, but I'll have a, another helpful helper function for that. I can say draw display, draw changes or something. Update display. Would that make more sense? That would probably make more sense. Update screen, if I'm going with the clear screen. The screen mnemonics. We'll just, we'll say that. And I know we'll at least need the config to get the colors. So let's do that here. So call it void update screen. I'll say update window with any changes. Update screen. Right now we'll do this and We'll simply call stl render present given the renderer, which I didn't go through in the docs. So that's how you actually show the changes. Yeah, stl's rendering operates on a back buffer, so calling a rendering function does not directly put the line on the screen, but updates the back buffer. Um, you compose your scene and then present the composed back buffer as a complete picture. Yes. So does all, once you do all drawing intended for this current frame, you call this function once per frame to present it. And you're encouraged to call render clear before starting each new frame. Okay, so I'm thinking that I'll just handle chip 8 doing that, because it won't necessarily be updating on every frame. It'll update when the chip 8 emulation tells it to update the screen, because that's how the chip 8 worked. So I'm hoping that'll work, and I'm not going to clear it every frame to save some performance maybe or something. but. We can change that later if we need to, that's fine. But just render present given the renderer. So whatever color the renderer is set to, this will show that color. So I guess I don't need to set the config right now. Because that'll just show whatever the renderer is set to. So I do need a renderer, however. So I guess I do need something in here. We'll say we'll pass in the SDL object to that. And other mistakes that I've made, SDLT. Oh, set the draw color. Yeah, I need that here. We'll pass in SDL as well to clear screen, because I need the, the renderer for this. So we'll do that as well. But I guess if that's changing the renderer, does this need to be constant? Well, that's a pointer, so it shouldn't matter. It's going to use the pointer. OK, that's not changing the struct but it'll affect it through the pointer. Okay. Yeah, I'm not using delay because I wanted to go over that, so let's do that. Sorry if I'm going a bit uh, out of whack here. My brain's, you know, in several places at once, and I'm trying to calm it down. Maybe a little too much coffee today, or not enough, depending who you are. It is some tasty bitter bean juice, though. I do like it. So what am I looking for? Delay timer. There we go. SDL timer, that has a delay, which is a unsigned integer for a number of milliseconds. We don't have a way to specify floats, right, for a delay, so we won't be exactly 60 hertz. We'll be around 60 hertz, approximately 16 or 17 milliseconds. We'll have a little bit of delay, you know, from calling and executing this function, whatever it does under the hood, but I'm going to set it to 16 milliseconds and say, we'll fudge it a little bit and say, eh, that's, that's 60 FPS. 
That's 60 hertz. So let's say uh, approximately, approximately this, which would normally be 16.6 .6 repeating or 16.67 milliseconds, but okay. I mean, we can give it this and it'll be sort of coerced into an int, but that's fine. Then we'll update the screen. And the way I'm doing it like this is so that later I can emulate instructions above this. So we'll say emulate uh, chip eight instructions. And then according to how long that takes, let's say uh, get time, some abstract function here that we don't have implemented. Get time, get time elapsed since last get time. Then we can delay for however much time was actually spent emulating the instructions. And this won't be exactly 16 later. We'll have like 16 minus actual time elapsed. So I'm gonna do that later so that we have a sort of constant update for the screen and for the chip eight timers, which also run at a 60 Hertz rate. But I'm not doing that right now. Well, let me actually put this in, otherwise I'll forget. <laughs> but okay, I'm not doing that right now, I just wanna see if this works and shows a window. So let's do that, assuming that's correct, okay. So we should have a yellow window, it'll be very small, or a black window actually, I called it black. Foreground color I made yellow. So let me make the background color yellow. Of course this also shows that we need to change the window to be larger and uh, the window's not gonna disappear because I'm not taking an input. So that's, uh, that's good. <laughs> but I called this chip eight so I can search for it and kill it with fire. So let's just uh, burn that sucker to the ground and get rid of it. <laughs> and it's not still out there, right? Okay, let's make the window a little bit bigger and make it yellow, so. Let's just make both the colors yellow. This one, you know what, I can make white. But for testing drawing purposes, we'll make yellow just to make sure that works. But okay, let's make the window larger. Um, as part of the config, let's say we have the window size affected by the user. They can change it if they want through command line flags or otherwise. I'm gonna have what I'm gonna call a scale factor that is a factor to scale something by, and this something will be the size of a chip eight pixel. So originally at the original resolution, 64 by 32, you can think of that as emulating a single pixel for each one of those 64 by 32 pixels, which I think is 2048, two kilobytes. But if we want a larger screen, you know, that's actually visible and playable, I wanna scale that pixel by a certain amount. Um, I'm not gonna do fractional scaling because I'm lazy and I just wanna deal with integers. So we'll do integer scaling here. Um, and let's say this is the amount to scale a chip eight pixel by 20X will be a 20X larger window. That should be hopefully reasonable enough. So I'm gonna set the initial scale factor in the config to 20. So we'll say the default Resolution will be 64 by 20, which is 640 by two. So 1280 by um, 320 times two is 640. So that'll at least be a more visible window that we can work with. And when we pass that config into the initialize SDL function, where we set the width and height, I can multiply by the scale factor. So let's do that here. Multiply by that, okay. So assuming that all compiles, it does. I can see we should have a larger window and it should be yellow. Hopefully, and it is, hey, there we go. A good, uh, good color. So we still can't close the window. I'm gonna do input next because I wanna be able to close the window and sort of wrap up this intro video. Um, it's that time of the year where I have low circulation because I need to exercise more and move around and take breaks, but uh, my hands get cold, so I got my, my burglar hands, right? <laughs> or whatever you call these. Fingerless gloves, right? Not burglar hands. Uh, okay, I, I gotta end this again. Unfortunately, stop that, which it doesn't stop, but I just wanna see where it is in pgrep. So I can make, make this window halt and catch fire, and it doesn't like that, so we gotta really stick the uh, thermite on there. There we go. 
All right, let's do input, right? So that we don't have infinite loops and things and forgetting that we kept the window in the background. We don't want that. Let's set up actual input. So I'll do this. Let's say we do this first. Handle user input here. We'll just call it handle input. We'll send in args to it in a second. Yeah, but let's just say we have a handle input function. I can do it here, that's fine. Handle input. So how do we do that within SDL? I know we use events, which I remember that from the past, just in case you don't know and you need to know where to look, that is under events, input events. So we're doing input. I will be doing the keyboard events to handle keyboard input. Okay, so I'll just go to the main page here, event handling. It's events are initialized with video and we did that, so we are okay. We will be using the event structure, so let's look at that. And the poll event function. This is the sort of list of events that we can use. I will be doing keyboard events specifically, but that's okay. Also the quit event. So we can just, if, if you have like a red X, you can press that on the window and it'll close it. We'll do that as well. So we can read and place events on the queue. I'll probably just be reading from the queue. So we need an event structure here and we'll call poll event, which will remove stuff from the event. Pass the event as a pointer. Okay. So we have an event queue, and when you type on the keyboard, or move your mouse or your gamepad, your joystick, it'll add events to the queue, the input event. It'll add it to the queue, and when you call poll event, it'll say, hey, do we have anything there? Yes, it'll pop that last event off. It's just a, I believe it's a LIFO stack, so it'll pop it off, and then as long as you still have events on the queue, you can, this will still be called. When you have no more events on the queue, it'll return false and we'll go on, right? But okay, it sort of works as a queue or a stack structure. And I think it's, I, I wanna say it's last in first out. It might be first in first out actually to go through the, uh, the queue. I should remember my fundamental data structures. Unfortunately, my brain is tired, but that's okay. <laughs> Let's go through this. We'll just call poll event. We'll switch on the type of event. Um, I'll be doing the quit and the quit and keyboard events. I think window event is like if you resize or move the window or something. There's other things, but yeah, mouse motion, other things. But I'll do that. Event types and members. Key down and key up or for the keyboard event, we'll be messing with those as well. For the quit event, we can check for SDL quit. And these are, <laughs> I'm a child, so just reading finger motion kind of makes me giggle. But anyway, I guess that's for a touch screen, not anything. Uh, adult related so <laughs> so we'll go through the event here we'll pop things off there we'll switch on the type and the type will be key down key up for keyboard events or the type will be sdl quit for a quit event so let me go through that as the neighbor's dog is barking hopefully you don't hear that so we'll have this and we'll have while sdl poll event event So while there is still an event on the queue, we'll pop that off and we will switch on the type, event.type. And for the quit event, if I just wanna exit the window, if you have like a red X in the corner, you can press, or for my window manager, I'll just do like a control alt X, I think we'll exit in CWM. So I'll be doing that. So we'll do exit window end program. And I, I need a way to tell our infinite loop that we want to quit. So I know I'll have to do that somehow. I'll probably have like an enum of sorts or something here. Let's do it up here. I'm gonna have a thing with um, some different states. We'll say we have like a state machine. So I'm gonna have an enum. I'll call it emulator state. Or if that's too long, we can do emu state, but that makes me think of the bird. So I don't wanna do that. <laughs> but let's say we have a, we have a state that, that the emulator is running in for our, our game loop, our emulator loop later. I'll say we have a quit state, we have a running state, and we have a pause state, in case we want to pause for debugging or some purposes later. So we'll do that. Let me label these as well, not that I need to. So I have an SDL container object. Let's have emulator configuration. And let's have emulator states. Okay. 
So the reason I'm doing that is because I'm also going to have, um, mainly in the next video, but I'll set up a, a tiny base here. I'll have a chip eight machine object or whatever. So I'm gonna have another type def here and I'm gonna put in a state for the chip eight object so that we can pass that to the handle input function. And we can say, is this particular chip eight machine? Maybe you wanna do multiple later. So if we make an instantiate one and attach some state to it, we can say this particular window for this chip eight can be paused or running and another one could be running a different game or something. I, I don't know why you do multiple windows, but maybe you want to. <laughs> this is just how I have this divvied up here. Um, and I'll add more fields to this, but right now this is gonna be pretty bare. Let's say we have this, we have it as state. And we can initialize that. Uh, we'll just do that here. Initialize chip eight machine. So you see I'm doing some sort of patterns here for a reason. <laughs> um, and I think I set quit as the first one, right? Yeah, so I think these start at zero, but just to make sure, that'll be zero and this should be one and two, but we won't have to interrogate those, but okay. Because I'll have a function to init and I'll say if we don't, initialize well i don't have to do that actually i can just return a bool from this right yeah so never mind no forget i did that i didn't do that <laughs> i don't need to set that explicitly i'll say if we don't initialize this it was wrong same as the others we'll have an exit condition and i need to make this function but the reason i'm doing this is because i'm going to pass the chip 8 into the input and we'll say um, while chip eight state is not quit, which is not how I want to do that. I want to do while the state is not equal to quit, we'll run through handle input may change the state. So later on I can do like if state is paused or this will be chip eight, wouldn't it? If chip eight state is paused, we can continue and just be in like a busy loop while it's waiting. So I can do that later on. Uh, but right now we won't do that. We'll just say we'll handle the input here. But that may change the state later, so that's why I want to have that. Because uh, we can change the state to quit and it'll leave the loop. Let's do that in here. Let's do... We'll have a chip8 pointer. The chip8. Let's say we change the state. Chip8 state equals quit. We'll exit main emulator loop. And other than that, we want to do keyboard inputs. So let's do SDL key down. And later we'll also handle SDL key up. And this should give me an error for implicit fall throughs, right? Do I get errors for that? Um, it doesn't actually, because I don't have other things. Emulator, this needs a semicolon. I'm just trying to make sure I have fall through errors, because I know those sometimes I forget. Uh, but that's okay. Yeah, implicit declaration. Well, no. <laughs> I read implicit. Uh, what if I do this? This isn't something I need to be spending all this time on. Main is normally non static. That's interesting. Implicit declaration of init chip 8. Yeah, I don't have that, do I? Um, that's true. Let's do that. After set config, let's do initialize chip eight machine, initialize a new one. This way also, if I implement like a reset feature, we can just call this function again, hopefully, and it'll just reset everything up. That would be nice. So that's also why I'm doing this. Have it be, yeah, we can pass the pointer because we got to keep the state. We'll just have that here and we'll say we have the chip eight and the state by default will be running. Default um, machine state on running. We'll say, okay. Uh, 170, so I didn't end some things right, I guess. Did I not? Oh, I didn't end the, uh, the switch, duh. I need a default anyway. I don't need one, but I'll put a default anyway. 
It does work. Okay, so I didn't want this here because that would be an implicit fall through, but let's say uh, that's not going to be correct, right? <laughs> oh, well. I just wanted to make sure that the, the compiler would enforce that I have to do breaks, but I think it does. I'm just not doing it correctly. But anyway, we'll have key down and key up events. There are chip eight instructions for checking if a key is pressed or not. So that's what these will come into play for later. And I'll probably have the chip eight keypad be part of the sort of chip eight object here, but that'll be later, maybe in the next video or the one after. But let's make sure first off, cause I'm talking too much that let's make sure that the quit event works, right? Let's see if I quit out from my window manager for me is control alt X. It does quit. Hey, that's good to know. And it's not there waiting in the background because it doesn't show up there. So that's good. Okay. So let's do the keyboard as well. I knew that the quit event worked there off the top of my head, but let's also do the, um, the keyboard support, the keyboard events from SDL event. SDL key code, scan code. So these are key codes we can check for. I want sort of just the event page here. Yeah, keyboard event. So keyboard event are used when an event of type key down or key up is reported. And we have those. Yeah, we're handling those cases here for these event types. So you access this through the events key field. Okay. We have the event.type, we'll also have event timestamp, window ID, state, pressed or released, repeat, or key sim. So key sim normally doesn't show up in the event, but if the type is one of these two, then key sim will be in the event's key field. So we'll have to do event.key.keysim.sim or dot scan code or mod to check what control shift or other modifiers are there. I'm gonna I'm gonna be doing sim for key codes because SDLK is shorter to type than SDL scan code. Although I think SDL scan code works across keyboard layouts and SDLK does not, or maybe it was vice versa. I don't remember, but I'll be, I'll be checking the uh, key code value. No, I'll just check the key code value. And let's say we do, um, I don't want the, uh, the Vimium search because it doesn't work a lot of the time. Let's do escape. We'll say escape will escape the program. <laughs> So that will also end the program, just as an example here. SDLK escape. So I need to check for key down or key up later. We can switch on the events dot key dot key symbol dot sim for symbol. And we can have a case for SDLK escape. So escape, this is the escape key. We'll say this will exit window and end the program as well. So we'll do the same thing we do for the quit event. I'll just set the state to quit and we'll return. Yeah, we'll do that. And for a default, we'll do nothing. It'll just go on through. Okay, so later we can do, you know, WASD or whatever keys we want to set up for the hexadecimal keypad for input. We can do that later. But I just want some basic example of the key working here. The keyboard input working. So I will do that. So we have our window, we can exit with the red X or the window manager keybinds or what have you, whatever's on your machine, or I can press escape and it'll escape the window. And again, just to make sure that we ended correctly and we don't have it out there in resident memory. Hey, we're good. Okay, so we have a window showing up. It's just yellow, but it's big enough to see and we can input with it at a basic level with the keyboard. We can interact with it rather, that's English. Um, we don't have sound or anything, that'll be later. But we have a window pop-up, we have basic SDL boilerplate, we have some structs and stuff that we can work from, we have a place to initialize SDL, um, any flags or configuration we want to set, say from command line arguments. Uh, we can change the values in a chip 8 machine that we set up for like the RAM and registers and things later for defaults, or maybe on a reset case. And we should be clearing up these things all right as well for final cleanup so we don't have leftover memory leaks or what have you. We can draw color, handle input, and we have a sort of main loop that goes at right now 60 hertz approximately. Handling input, and I think we're good right now. So this is going to be my basic um, sort of intro video to this. The next video, I'll lay out the chip 8 machine as far as the memory and registers and, disp and display and things, the keypad.
probably just in this struct up here. Uh, this chip 8 struct, I'll add that in here, and I'll go ahead and start emulating instructions. And we'll get to where we can run or display a basic test ROM to, uh, to test our instructions, or at least to test like um, some basic <laughs> ROM without many instructions in it. Uh, there's an IBM logo that only tests like eight instructions or seven instructions just to display, you know, a logo. So I'll probably use that as the example. So we'll probably end up emulating seven or eight instructions on the next one and displaying a logo, and that may be it. But if it doesn't take too long, then I can go on from there and do, you know, the rest of the instructions for the machine. But hopefully you enjoyed. This is an intro video, so it didn't really get too deep into chip eight. So apologies there if this was clickbait at all. Hopefully it's not. But, you know, that's all I'm going to do here. I want to thank you for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. Yeah. Cheers.